Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Wound Care in 2020, How Point-of-Care Bacterial Imaging is Shifting the Wound Assessment Paradigm, sponsored by Moleculite. My name is Miranda Henry, the Editorial Director of Wound Source, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. Today's program will describe how Moleculite's point-of-care fluorescence imaging device, the Moleculite IX, can improve wound triage, treatment selection, and evaluation of treatment efficacy. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers, Catherine Milne and Jenny Herlow. Catherine is an advanced practice wound ostomy incontinence nurse providing care in the acute, long-term care, home health, and outpatient settings. Jenny is a geriatric nurse practitioner and wound ostomy continence nurse who has 20 years experience managing acute and chronic wounds. Also with us today is Monique Rennie from Moleculite. Catherine and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Jenny is going to get things started. Thank you, Miranda. Today, Kathy and I plan to discuss how Moleculite has helped us to address some of the challenges we face in wound care. Moleculite's Director of Scientific Affairs will first provide an overview of how this device works and the supporting clinical evidence for its use. Then Kathy and I will share with you how Moleculite has altered our approach to wound assessment how this document has improved our wound hygiene, and how it has helped us with wound dressing selection. Finally, we'll share how this device has helped us to deliver effective wound care more efficiently during and certainly after our challenges with COVID-19. As we all know, chronic wounds take months and years to close. And we have found through the literature and the science behind wound care that a lot of this is related to bacterial overload. We have known that infection can impact about 80% of the reasons why our wounds don't heal. And although we've considered these things critically colonized, you know what, we're really thinking that these are indolent infections that we are not really aware of. So now we have a device to help us. Cellulitis is the most common cause of readmission to hospitals and which has financial impacts for all, both acute care and home care and for long-term care. And we also know that infection is the most common cause of the amputation. The current standard for evaluating a wound for signs of infection, such as redness, heat, odor, or pain, is subjective, therefore can lead to delays in diagnosis. Further, these signs of infections may be blunted in some patients, therefore leading to misdiagnosis. Wounds without the classic signs and symptoms of infection may still harbor concerning levels of bacteria that can promote in infection, especially um, on a compromised host. Currently, wound care lacks the tools to help providers with this point-of-care decision-making. This is an example that Jenny was talking about in a wound that doesn't have a classic sign of infection. So I think most of us would say and question, is this wound infected at all? And a lot of providers, whether you're experienced and maybe not as experienced in wound care, have to think, am I culturing this? Should I culture this? And if I do culture this, where would I take that culture from? The old saying is you can't find a fever if you don't take the temperature. Well, guess what? You can't effectively treat what you can't see when it comes to infection. And now we have a device to help us. Behold, we have a wonderful new device to share with you today, which has the potential to change your wound care practice. Moleculite is a device that allows visualization of bacteria real time in your wounds to allow immediate diagnostic feedback. 
This device has a long battery life and is very easy to carry to and from all of your work settings. The evaluation it provides is non-invasive, and this device is safe to use in all wounds and in all settings. So first, first up is um, the Director of Moleculite Scientific Affairs, who would like to speak with you about how this device works and share some of the evidence behind its use. The Molecular IX uses uh, fluorescence imaging technology, a safe violet light, and it's violet. It's not ultraviolet, so it's entirely safe. Excites the tissues and other components in and around wounds. And those components send back signals to the device. Tissue appears green, and that's due to matrix components such as collagen and fibrin sending back a green signal. And most bacteria fluoresce a red color, a result of porphyrin production. Porphyrins are endogenously produced by these bacteria as part of the heme pathway. Now, uniquely, Pseudomonas aeruginosa fluoresces a cyan or blue-green color, so clinicians can immediately know that that species is present in the wound and target it. Both these colors, red and cyan, have been shown to be indicative of bacterial loads of 10 to the 4 colony-forming units per gram, alone known to delay healing, and on a culture scale, that's roughly moderate to heavy growth. Here we're seeing some examples of what red fluorescence can look like. It might look like a bright, bright red. It may look a little more pink, like the wound that's in the middle, or it may look yellowy orange. All of these colors of red have been, uh, are indicative of bacterial loads of 10 to the 4 CFU per gram or higher. And you can see the species uh, that were detected in these wounds on the slide. Here are some examples of cyan fluorescence from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This cyan is a bluish green color. It sometimes can appear a bright glowing white when it becomes very intense at high loads. And you can see that this bluish green cyan color looks very distinct from the background tissue. It looks artificial and very fluorescent. And in each of these images, uh, the presence of Pseudomonas could immediately be detected and targeted for treatment. These results from a clinical trial are showing the bacterial loads that are detected in regions of red fluorescence. You can see that in this trial of 60 wounds, the positive predictive value of red fluorescence was 100%. And that means that every time red fluorescence was sampled uh, using biopsies or using curatage samples, those samples came back positive for bacterial loads greater than 10 to the 4 CFU per gram. Uh, often those loads were much higher, 10 to the 5, 6, 7, 8. And on a culture scale, that mostly translated to moderate to heavy growth. This slide is showing results of a 350 patient trial conducted at 14 sites across the United States by 20 clinicians. This slide was comparing uh, the detection of bacteria at loads greater than 10 to the 4 CFU per gram uh, between standard of care, which is clinical signs and symptoms assessment, um, compared to use of the molecular IX. The gray bars at the top show the sensitivity of the clinical signs and symptoms assessment. It was very low. 20% or under, depending on the wound type. Um, and although this seems quite low, this is very consistent with what's been reported in the literature and even in meta-analysis. The sensitivity when moleculite was used to detect regions of bacteria at these loads uh, was fourfold higher, and that's shown in the dark blue bars. Now, when those same images were uh, reviewed and interpreted by more experienced clinician readers, clinicians who had had experience incorporating this device into their clinic, the sensitivities increased to even higher, an average 80% across all the wound types in this study. 
So what bacterial species does the Molecular AX visualize? Well, we've looked at more than 30 bacterial species, and we've seen that 28 of the most common wound pathogens are readily detectable uh, by the device. This includes gram-negatives, gram-positives, aerobes, and anaerobes. Uh, the, the only um, pathogens uh, typically prevalent in wounds that are not detectable uh, by the device are streptococcus and enterococcus. In addition to detecting these species planktonically, um, studies have also been performed to demonstrate that bacteria within a biofilm uh, readily, uh, readily fluoresce red as well, and that that's detectable by the device. You can see some in vivo evidence uh, of bacterial fluorescence from biofilms uh, shown on this slide. Uh, in vitro evidence has also been achieved. And all of those biofilm studies have used scanning electron microscopy images to confirm co-localization of bacteria and EPS matrix, which is the hallmark of a biofilm. In addition to the detection of bacteria through fluorescence that the device enables, it's also a wound measurement tool. So the device has digital wound measurement software, which enables measurement of wound area, length, and width. It automatically detects uh, the, the boundaries of the wound and computes wound area. It also allows for the clinician to input a depth measurement for that wound and record it. All of those measurements are overlaid on top of the wound, saved as a JPEG file, and can be exported to an electronic health record. Uh, clinical trials uh, on the uh, measurement feature have shown that the measurement accuracy is higher than 95 per, is higher than 94 percent, uh, and there was very low variability between clinicians using the measurement function. Having the ability to track wound area over time, in addition to bacterial presence over time, is very powerful. This is a 12-week case series that monitored both of those parameters over, 12, over the 12 weeks in 11 wounds. And what it found was that red fluorescence in the wound persisted on average for almost four weeks. Red fluorescence in those wounds uh, was aggressively targeted with debridement, occasionally antimicrobials, but importantly, no antibiotics were used in this study. None of the wounds healed or entered a healing trajectory while red fluorescence, indicative of bacteria, was present on the images. And when, when the clinician looked at the average wound area change per week, there was a dramatic difference in the weeks where bacterial fluorescence was present, shown in the red bar, uh, and when bacterial fluorescence was present, on average, the wound area was increasing per week by about 6%. So those wounds were deteriorating. But as soon as the bacterial fluorescence was eliminated through debridement, um, there was an immediate shift and a dramatic switch onto a healing trajectory. So you can see in the white bar, in weeks where bacterial fluorescence was absent, the wound area change per week with a decrease of 27%. Fluorescence information enabled better debridement to the appropriate level, something that Jenny and Kathy will talk about, and it was able to avoid use of antibiotics, instead relying on other means to target the bacteria. Let's take another look at that clinical trial of 350 wounds to see how the information on fluorescence guided aspects of wound care in that study. Clinicians reported that wound assessment was impacted in 79% of all uh, cases in that study. Um, wound bed preparation was impacted in 85% of patients in that study, and that's something that I know Kathy and Jenny are going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, and antimicrobial stewardship and treatment selection were also impacted in more than half of the study wounds. In fact, if you compare the treatment plan changes with and without fluorescence information, uh, antimicrobial application was influenced, it was directly changed, 
in 42% of the study wounds. And that included escalating uh, level of antimicrobial or antibiotic when needed, and also de-escalating when it wasn't needed, or switching to a more targeted product, such as when Pseudomonas was detected on the images. This is just a snippet of some of the evidence uh, on the Moleculite IX procedure. Um, I've shown here that the device detects fluorescence as red or cyan from bacteria at the point of care at 10, loads of 10 to the 4 colony forming units per gram or higher. This is all done without the need for any contrast agents or contact with the patient. Fluorescence from bacteria is detected from 28 of the most common wound pathogens, and it's also detected from bacteria in biofilm. When bacterial imaging is added into the um, assessment plan, it can increase detection of bacteria um, by fourfold compared to clinical signs and symptoms of infection alone. And now I'll pass things back over to Jenny and Kathy to talk about some of their own cases and how this is changing their care. Before Jenny and I ex share our experiences with you, I showed you this picture earlier on in the presentation. Would you culture this? Where would you culture this? And would this be beneficial if you used Moleculite? Well, if you look at the scan here, you're actually seeing lots of Pseudomonas. The Moleculite um, showed the Pseudomonas on the outside of the wound, and it really helps us determine where to do a culture. And yes, you do have a problem here. So how is Moleculite changing our practice and should be considered for your use when you want to change your wound care practice? Jenny and I are going to share some things about our experiences. This device actually has a number of utilities. Not only can you measure and use this device to help you document, it actually enhances your assessment. Jenny's going to talk a little bit about wound hygiene in a little bit more detail, but it really has helped me improve my assessment skills and improve the way I do wound bed preparation. Clearly, we're also going to talk about some of our cases in terms of how we have prevented the use of antibiotics and how you can use this device to see if your wound is ready to receive advanced therapies. How would you measure a wound like this? And one of the things that we find in terms of reviewing cases for especially for legal issues and also for quality concerns is the variety of wound measurements you you re will receive. So when you have an irregular wound, it's really difficult to get consistent measurement over time. So if you're just reading a uh, piece of paper and you're finding the measurements, you know, large one week and small the other the next week, it's usually because of interrater reliability is, is very very poor. Uh, we, you have people uh, who go from acute care to long-term care to home care, and everybody measures a little bit differently. And sometimes they use rulers that are not exactly calibrated uh, and, and equal in, in its um, size and shape. Uh, so this is a, a wonderful way to be able to document your wound and how you are progressing. Because remember, we're being measured in terms of quality on our improvement of wound size. Our wound size is telling us you need to change therapy, you're doing well, you need to continue, whatever, you're ready for advanced therapy. So getting accurate documentation is really important. This is a really interesting case of mine. So this is a patient who has uh, exposed hardware. You can see that on the standard image, and it was really located on her left lateral ankle. The wound, the tissue surrounding the wound doesn't look really terrible. In fact, it almost looks like a contact dermatitis, 
uh, related to the dressing is square. She has cellulitis, and it was very difficult to actually determine this because when you see on the left-hand side the upper uh, picture, you have uh, two legs that are very, very red. She has lymphedema, so it's hard sometimes to de determine whether you're looking at gravitational erythema or cellulitis. When I did an infrared measurement of both legs, it was clear that I do have cellulitis of the leg. So we uh, assumed that this patient with exposed hardware in a uh, healthcare setting where this patient was residing would have MRSA. So we did do a moleculite scan of the wound, and guess what? We have nothing that is fluorescing at all. When you don't have fluorescence, we had to assume that, again, as Monique said, uh, the two most common bacteria that you do see in the wound that don't fluoresce are strep and enterococcus. We did do a culture, and um, we, but before we got our culture back, we changed her from the uh, vancomycin to another appropriate agent that would cover both of these bacteria. And when we did cut her culture back, she was positive for strep. So we actually saved this uh, patient 48 hours of receiving an IV antibiotic that would have been inappropriate for her. In the picture on the left, you see a large wound on the plantar surface of this diabetic's right great toe. You can see the cyan color of opportunistic pseudomonas on the macerated tissue around the side of the wound indicated by a red arrow. There's also a red fluorescent glow just to the left of that red arrow within the bed of necrotic tissue. This red glow was used to guide a culture specimen which grew out staph, which was then treated. Upon further examination of the picture on the left, I also noticed a small red fluorescence at the base of the fifth toe. This alerted me to another small but brightly glowing wound, uh, that bright glow indicating a high bacteria load. The second wound was initially overshadowed in significance by the great toe wound. However, moleculite helped to bring this second area to my attention. This smaller wound was treated and healed by the following week. But as we all know, if left untreated, a wound of any size on a diabetic foot can lead to a limb-threatening infection. In summary, I hope we have given you an idea of how moleculite can be used to evaluate the health of tissue in wounds, including alerting you to wounds you may otherwise have missed and an idea of how this device can assist in real-time decision-making on next course of action, such as where to obtain a swab specimen for culture, and how this device can be used to teach your patient. This device can provide live evidence to support that each of the recommendations we give our patients are not just a theoretical exercise, but that they actually help to prevent limb-threatening infections. The next concept we are going to discuss is how the moleculite device can help you to promote more effective wound hygiene. Many of you may not yet heard of the wound hygiene concept. This comes from a recently published consensus document funded by Convitec but developed at a meeting in London last year by an international and multidisciplinary team of wound experts. This concept seeks to promote common acceptance of the need to control wound infection risk by aligning this need with the hygiene we, experts and non-experts alike, currently accept as important for protecting all parts of our body from unwanted microbial load. Just as control of tooth plaque, which is a biofilm on the teeth, requires a cleansing um, and maintenance regi regime to prevent cavities, which are tooth infections, 
Wound hygiene describes a treatment regime composed of wound-specific strategies known to control biofilm progression in a wound with the ultimate goal of preventing wound infection. One of the key things that this molecularized uh, device or um, moleculating a wound, which is a verb, um, if you moleculate a wound, um, this will guide you through a more thorough refash refashioning of the wound edges um, listed in the third phase of wound hygiene by showing that in some cases this step three must involve more than simply removing callus so as to free up epithelium for migration across a wound. Jenny, I'm really glad you said the word or verb moleculite or moleculating uh, a wound. I, I use that all the time. And in fact, some of the uh, treatment nurses and other team members that I work with will go, let's moleculate that wound. And and so it, it really will become its its own uh, way of of guiding uh, assessment and treatment in in its own right, so to speak. This is a case from Rosemary Hill in Canada where she really uh, see, demonstrates the, the importance of, of wound hygiene. I think a lot of us look at the wound, and especially this one, it's nice, it's pink, it looks good. Uh, when she scanned the uh, tissue, you can actually see that while the wound is is pretty good, uh, you you know blood is actually dark, and you can see the dark in there. The surrounding tissue shows a lot of hyperkeratosis uh, and a lot of pseudomonas around that bacteria. So what she did was really was looking for the ability to try out her wound cleansers, and um, so she used her saline cleanser, and then. On the second uh, scan, she used a non-cytotoxic cleanser, and this was the first one. And you could see a little bit of improvement. And then she actually did a third cleanser. And what she found is actually that third cleanser was uh, superior. She was able to have real-time data and then data that actually people can respond to because it's a picture. And she took this to her value analysis committee and was able to make clinical decisions on objective data. So it's a great uh, device to use to help substantiate your clinical choices in terms of products and in care. I don't think anybody listening to this webinar would disagree that this wound needs debridement. And when you really look at it, you're, you would be focusing a lot of your time and effort probably on that lower edge where it's macerated. If you did do that, you would probably miss that little red area up at top where that small arrow is. And this is a great way to determine if your debridement is appropriate and not only in the level of depth, but also in uh, the placement of your debridement. And then, so you can keep on, quote unquote, moleculating your wound as you debride to see, get some real-time feedback on your performance and how you are improving that wound bed. This was an interesting case because this was a patient who was admitted to a long-term care facility with a long-standing sacral pressure ulcer. When you look at this wound, you might think that the uh, macerated edges might require a different type of treatment in terms of the uh, moisture management of this wound. Uh, I'm looking at this as an epiboly, and we may need to do something more about it. The wound itself looked pretty good. When we scanned the wound using the moleculite device, you can see that the wound is harboring both pseudomonas and the cyan, uh, I mean the red coloring. And when I uh, approached the uh, surgeon about who was managing this patient on the outside, about the epiboly, at first he really wasn't um, really 
overly enthusiastic about doing a, a more extensive surgical debridement on this patient uh, to manage this epiboly. But when we showed him the scan, he was really impressed and really uh, re became a, a lot more interested in trying to reduce the amount of bacteria in the wounds and treat this epiboly. So it really worked to help facilitate collaboration uh, with this patient. So this was a diabetic foot ulcer on a middle-aged patient with neuropathy. Uh, the debridement of callus revealed profoundly macerated tissue, which is not an uncommon finding in this case. And after moleculating it, uh, this, uh, I saw a lot of bright red fluorescence indicative of bacteria. Um, additional debridement was performed to remove bacteria-laden tissue, which you can see, surrounding the ulcer's bed. Removing these bacteria decreases local bacteria load, logically decreasing risk for development of resistant wound infection, uh, which would increase likely, uh, and if you debrided, it would increase the likelihood of uncomplicated wound resolution. So looking more carefully at this last picture on the right, you can see that the peri-ulcer fluorescence has decreased. But what else do you see? Interestingly, this last photo picked up another wound developing in the web space between toes one and two, picking up a significant bacteria load in this somewhat obscured site. This alerted me to another wound, which thankfully was therefore caught early. The mas macerated tissue was debrided. The wound was added to the plan of care. Then I used this device to enforce the need uh, for this patient to participate in his recommended dressing changes, offloading, and blood glucose control. These diabetic foot ulcers were both fully resolved in one month without complication. This is a step-by-step -step series of photos from a debridement case study. You can see how the debriding progressed from initial presentation where undermining was suspected, then initial debridement that revealed the red fluorescence, including the side abscess, the clinician debrided further to clean off that fluorescing tissue and then performed a betadine soak after all debridement possible was done and took a measurement of the final wound. Um, here you can see also um, a video, a real-time video of debridement with a curette, which is what I will typically use. Uh, the betadine soak is something to consider. Uh, we all know that research, um, the research that shows that betadine is toxic to granulation tissue. We're warned not to use iodine or betadine in wound care. But in this case, the betadine is used to address the bacteria load in the peri tissue, which, if not debrided and thoroughly cleansed, may lead to a wound infection. So in summary, mole moleculite can be used to support a more effective peri-ulcer wound hygiene process, leading to more thorough wound bed preparation. Moleculite allows for instant feedback about the, the effectiveness of your interventions. Let's move on to treatment selection. While we all want to do antimicrobial stewardship, what we don't know, and this is a new horizon for us all, is the impact of our dressing selection. And now we can get some real, real-time real feedback. This is a really good example of how you can get immediate feedback with regard to your secondary and primary dressing treatment. As you can see here, we have a patient with a leg ulcer. She is being treated with uh, lymphedema and management of her venous 
insufficiency with compression. But she did have a lot of exudate, and when you can look at the moleculite scan, you almost see a square uh, glowing and uh, on the peri wound skin. So we do need to address the wound hygiene. But but this was telling us that our secondary dressing that was supposed to help absorb exudate was not doing its job. We had still some red and salmon color fluorescence around the wound bed, so it also told us that we needed to be a little bit more aggressive on our uh, wound hygiene and debridement. Over on the right, you can see the first picture, which would be two weeks post changing the secondary and primary dressing, and then the last picture is the patient is almost completely healed, and that's four weeks post changing the topical dressings. I'm really excited because this gives us a whole new avenue to start studying dressings and individualized, personalized dressing topical management. A lot of times our purchasing agents are telling us that we can only stay to one type of or brand of dressing. Uh, a lot of times we are told that we things aren't available. But again, I think when we personalize our Treatment management, we will be able to improve our outcomes when we're looking at bundling costs in the near future. We will find that when we do have more availability of different types of products, then we might also be able to improve care and actually save money in the long run. And again, having some objective data to show people that changing dressing reg regimens and having a wider availability of products can be helpful. For example, you can see on the left-hand side, if you saw this patient and you saw the tons of drainage coming out of this thing, of course you would change the treatment because you want to control exudate. And you do see a little bit of uh, red in that dressing. So we did change the agent and when we saw the patient again. We were very pleased looking at the reduction in exudate. We were patting ourselves on the back. But then when we did a moleculite scan of the uh, device had, or the dressing itself, and the thing glowed. And so what we really were looking at is we now have pseudomonas, and we actually had to change the treatment again. Had we not had that immediate feedback of what was coming out on that exudate, then we, this patient may have developed a cellulitis or uh, something even worse. This is a left trochanter pressure ulcer on an elderly female with direction, but um, also a woman who's blessed to have a loving, dedicated, supportive husband. This wound initially presented with hard brown eschar for which we ordered enzymatic debreeder. Now, in an ideal world, I would have wanted an antimicrobial secondary, secondary dressing. But in the outpatient setting, um, at least in the U.S., this can be a home health cost challenge because many of the antimicrobial dressings most of us are aware of as being safe with the debriding enzyme um, are considered too expensive for home health and often substituted by outpatient DME providers. At any rate, uh, this photo was taken um, upon return to the wound, wound center, as Char now essentially gone, revealing adipose sub-Q with some peri-ulcer erythema. The dressing removed from the wound was gauze covered with enzymatic debrider and oil emulsion. This old dressing looks relatively innocuous with no significant discoloration and no odor. So now look at the fluorescent in images on the right. The wound bed is bright red showing clear evidence of infection for which she was treated with guided antibiotics. And then also look at the wound dressing. It contains a heavy load of bacteria confirming clinically what has been shown in the lab, that gauze is a great substrate for bacterial uh, growth. Uh, with the help of the molecular device, this patient is now oh, just a couple of weeks from being completely healed. 
These pictures reveal in real time what goes on in a dressing that is not changed in a timely fashion. On the left, Pseudomonas cyan and red fluorescing bacteria are observed throughout multiple layers of a bandage and even on the silver alginate dressing itself. The silver alginate dressing has clearly lost its antimicrobial properties, allowing microbes to grow on its surface and through into the secondary dressing. Remember, only concentrations of bacteria, um, only large concentrations of bacteria will fluoresce, meaning that there are very likely smaller bacteria concentrations on and throughout this dressing that are not visualized. Consider the implications here for home health or for patients who do their own dressing changes. On the right, a more sophisticated silver fiber dressing was used. This dressing has captured and appears to have killed much of the exudate, but even so, you can see the bright um, glow um, of a large blob um, for um, no better term, I guess, for this, of pseudomonas has escaped into the secondary dressing. Uh, so the bottom line in, here is that most dressing inserts mention an expiration of action as determined by laboratory tests. But as providers, we must consider the variables and challenges of the clinical setting and make sure to change dressings according to individual patient and wound needs. After all, wound care is about moisture management, a challenge not always replicated in the laboratory setting. We know that re patients that are going to receive cellular or tissue-based products often fail because of bacterial loads. And one of the things that the manufacturers always talk about is make sure your wound bed is prepared well. This is a patient of mine who was burnt over 90% of his body when he was 17. So fast forward, he's in his mid-40s. He's a farmer. He's sitting on the tractor. He has some sensation issues because of his extensive scarring and developed essentially a pressure ulcer on the posterior thigh. I was concerned when he first presented that he might have a marginal ulcer as a lot of these Scar tissue areas can ulcerate 10, 15, 20 years down the road, and they're really a malignant issue. So we did biopsy it. There did not show any cellular abnormalities that would suggest that. We have to be good consumers when we're using products that are costly, such as cellular and tissue-based products. Additionally, we know that our payers are looking at us in terms of how much we are costing them. So they can tell us how much we are spending on our patients. So we have to be good consumers of using the cellular and tissue-based products and use them appropriately, and that includes when we have good bed, wound bed preparation. This has given us a, a wonderful opportunity using the moleculite to really see if a patient is ready to receive such, such types of tissue. So we actually saw this um, person and we were thinking, wow, this guy's ready for um, some advanced tissue. Uh, and so what we did was we moleculated him and then just, you know, we were deflated because our wound bed preparation, which we thought was pretty good, obviously wasn't good enough and we would have most likely had cellular uh, tissue-based failure if we placed this on at this time. So we spent a lot of time doing wound bed preparation for this patient. To our surprise, when we initiated this wound bed prep, we brought him back and we thought, okay, are we ready to put on the, the tissue? And when we looked at the wound, it looked really good and it also had decreased dramatically in size. So we actually um, did our scan. We were sure showing markedly less bio burden around that wound, a little bit more fibrin inside the wound. And since our wound was smaller, we decided that, you know, maybe we can do this without 
using the cellular and tissue-based product. So I, I do love these products. They work wonders, but I hate putting a, more on than I need to because it's, it is costly. So what we did was we continued doing what we were doing, and you can see as this patient is progressing uh, every week and he's getting smaller and smaller, so we are actually saving uh, the insurance company money we are saving this patient a number of transportations back and forth uh, from the wound center because he only needs to come once a week. We would be certainly a lot more uh, aggressive uh, after placing a cellular or tissue-based product, especially in the, on a posterior thigh. We would we be much very worried that uh, even if we would use negative pressure as a bolster, that we would dislodge and not get the results we wanted. I think we'd all be remiss about not talking about the impact of COVID-19. The nice thing about this device is that I can take it to the home, I can use it in the wound clinic, I can use it at a long-term care facility, I can use it in acute care. Because I am able to visualize bacteria in the wound bed and around the wound bed, I can actually improve my uh, treatment right away and also use this as a teaching tool for the uh, nursing staff who may be doing wound care in between my visits. Jenny, do you have anything else to add here? Well, I would. Uh, the one thing I want to highlight is that Moleculite is a, a very mobile device, very easy to clean, easy to carry from one setting to the next wherever wound expertise is needed. And it allows evaluation and early detection of wound microbial load to allow timely treatment and avoid hospitalization, which I think is key right now with the COVID crisis. Yes, yeah, so I Moleculite does have a third-party reimbursement specialist who can provide specific information. Of course, Thorough documentation is essential when requesting reimbursement for any wound care procedure, and that really would extend to moleculite imaging procedure. In conclusion, we hope you have learned how this portable imaging device has revolutionized our wound care practice. The actionable information provided by the moleculite has added value to our practice by enhancing detection and decision-making at point of care, by facilitating improved wound hygiene, and by providing immediate feedback on the effectiveness of selected treatments. In addition to this actionable information, I find, and I'm sure Kathy will agree, that the moleculite images are useful to help patients understand the status of their wounds and also help us to collaborate with other clinicians to determine the best course of action required for wound healing. Thank you very much for your attention, and we would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Jenny and Catherine and Monique. We are now opening up the floor to questions for our guest speakers. To submit a question, please use the Q&A application and type your question in the field provided, then select Submit. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can during the next 10 minutes or so. Now for our first question. Uh, Monique, does the device image bacteria and biofilm at a level below the wound surface? Hello. Yes, the device does uh, measure uh, bacteria that's both planktonic and in biofilm. The device sees down to a depth of about one and a half millimeters into the tissue, and that will depend based on the tissue type, uh, how deep the device can, can image, but it does do surface and subsurface. Great. And how reliable are the results in terms of detection rate and positive predictive value? Great question. Great question. Uh, so studies have consistently shown that the positive predictive value of these red and cyan colors is above 95%. That's been shown across multiple site clinical trials around the world. 
And um, so clinicians can be very confident when they see those, those colors on the image that, that it is associated with the presence of bacteria at the uh, high loads. Thanks so much, Monique. Now, before our next question, I'd like to ask everyone in the audience to please take a moment to complete our quick poll, which should display on your screen here momentarily. And this will just help us find out how many have joined us for today's session. The question is, how many people in addition to yourself are watching the webinar with you today? If you are attending this webinar by yourself, simply enter a zero. And if you are in an in-service setting, an estimate is fine. And we thank you in advance for your response. Now, while the audience is taking the quick poll, um, Monique, I have another question for you. We've had several questions about this. Now, is the Molecular IX compatible with EMR system? Another very good question. Uh, yes, the Molecular IX has a program to integrate its platform into the leading EMR system. Uh, some of these have already been rolled out, and we're about to roll out integration, for example, with tissue analytics and with EPIC. Thank you. And how does the device detect Pseudomonas? Pseudomonas uniquely fluoresces that cyan color because of um, a, a virulent factor that it uniquely expresses called pyuveridin. And so that's what makes that cyan signal specific to Pseudomonas. It's endogenously produced by that specific bacteria. Thank you. One more question before we switch over to Kathy and Jenny. How does the system determine the concentration of bacteria on the wound? So the, the system indicates that the red and cyan colors that you see on the device indicate a minimum load of 10 to the 4 colony forming units per gram or higher. Now it might be much higher, but it does tell the clinician immediately that the bacteria load in that specific location is above uh, 10 to the 4 colony forming units per gram. So that's the way it gives information about load. Great. Thanks so much, Monique. Now I have a question for you, Kathy and Jenny. Do you typically use the Moleculite device before or after debridement? So maybe, Kathy, we can start with you. Uh, I actually use it both. When you, first of all, you need to know where you want to debride, and then you want to know how well you debrided so you can go back and continue if you did not do a, a good enough job. So I may take three, four, maybe even five um, device uh, readings during a debridement. And Jenny, your experience using the Moleculite device. Jenny, are you there? Hello? Sorry. Hi, Jenny. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry, you, sorry. Jenny. No problem. <laughs> okay. Asking about your experience using the molecular um, device before or after debridement. Both of, yes, both of both. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Okay, okay. Um, and mostly I've used it on diabetic foot ulcers with a callus. And what I find is there's maybe initially a little bit of a red glow if it's um, uh, I haven't seen a lot of the, the cyan, but there's usually a little bit of a red glow. And then when I debride the callus, which is usually hiding moisture, the red glow can become more pronounced. And then I continue to take pictures between debridement efforts because I want to debride the red glow, like I showed in one of the cases that I spoke about. You can actually remove the bacteria load, um, which could have otherwise led to an infection. So I, I do use it uh, several times, like Kathy does, before and after debridement. Thank you, Jenny. Now this question, next question, uh, Kathy, have you used the Moleculite device with any wound cleansers? Perhaps you can speak to your experience. Sure. Um, I pre presented a poster uh, at the fall SAWC. I evaluated a, a wound cleanser and um, to see, so, so the claim, the company claim was it was really great. And of course, being the skeptic, I didn't believe it. And so I actually used the wound cleanser to evaluate its uh, ability to um, impact bacteria. And so there's two things I really learned from this. It was my first exposure to moleculite. 
and I was totally stunned about the peri wound and how we really don't address the bacterial loads there. So I was um, impressed about that. But um, actually, uh, it really made me, and I talked about this earlier, is that the this device really makes you, uh, a, you know, think about how you are cleansing your wound, what you're cleansing with, and if it's working. Because if it's not working, you shouldn't be using it. So being, you know, raised on saline, I really have a whole different appreciation for wound cleansers now. And uh, I, you can see my, the abstract and the evaluation of this wound cleanser, which, you know, was successful. Um, it was published, the abstract was published in Wounds. Thanks so much, Kathy. Now, Monique, we have a clinician who has written us a question slash comment. Why, why shouldn't I just use a UV light source, such as a flashlight, to do the same thing as the Moleculite IAG without a picture being taken? Perhaps you can speak to the technology and the differences. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, UV light is known to excite bacteria as well. Um, but one of the things that's most important about this, well, there's two things that, that are uh, key differences here. So one is that uh, this is a specific wavelength of 405 nanometers, which is more optimal for exciting the bacteria and getting these signals. And it's also much safer. So it's a safe violet light rather than UV. But the other very important piece is that the device has uh, custom proprietary optical filters built into it. Um, so many of the, the colors that come back from a wound get filtered out. If you didn't have those optical filters, so many signals are coming back from tissue and bacteria that it's impossible to distinguish with this high reliability and accuracy what's what and, and what's really bacteria. Um, so the, the diagnostic accuracy measures that are so high with the device uh, would certainly not be so. Thanks so much, Monique. And we have time for a couple more questions. So, Kathy and Jenny, how long have you both been using the Moleculite system, and how long did it take you to get proficient in interpreting the images? Perhaps we can start with you, Jenny. Um, thank you. I have been using the molecu I have been moleculating um, since about January of this year, and I found that the red fluorescence was easy to pick up. I had a little more challenge uh, differentiating the cyan green with the green of a fibrin, um, but I I believe I have it now. Then the the they have the reps are very helpful. Kathy can probably talk more to that, but the the company reps will, are very good at teaching. Um, you're welcome. Yes, Jenny. I I would agree, Jenny. Uh, so I was using the Moleculite in 2019, again, to evaluate uh, wound cleansers, and then I moved on to some other dressings. Uh, and then based on that experience, I um, bought uh, a Moleculite during the onboarding process. Uh, the, the rep was totally wonderful. They flew out. They spent hours with me because I kept on peppering them with questions, and they were really, really patient. Yes. Um, I, will say, I will say that they um, there is a learning curve, and the more you use it, the better you get at it. And so, but I've been using it consistently since January. Um, so, you know, it again, it's it's fine tuning, and they're always available. Like you, know, I I I've I have called Monique, and I've called the rep, and say, hey, you know, um, you know, what am I seeing here? Or my trainer. So, so it's been really helpful. The support's been phenomenal. Thanks, yeah. Kathy. Um, we have time for one more quick question. This one's for you, Monique. How much does the Moleculite device cost, and how is it reimbursed? A number of questions okay. from the audience on these two matters. So we heard about reimbursement uh, right at the end of the presentation. Uh, I believe it was Kathy who, who mentioned that there are uh, two CPT codes uh, that are becoming active starting on July 1st for the molecular IAC procedure. Uh, and uh, our, our sales team can, can get interested parties in contact with our third-party reimbursement specialists for specific details on, on how they would be uh, billed and, and documented. 
Um, in regards to cost, the pricing, of course, varies slightly by geography. Um, so for questions about the cost of the system, the Moleculite sales team will gladly respond to anyone who's interested right after this webinar to discuss some of the many methods for acquiring the system, including options for leasing or for, or for purchase. So there, there's various options. Thanks very much. Thanks, Monique, and thank you, Kathy and Jenny. That's all the time we have for today's webinar. For those of you whose questions were not responded to during the Q&A, a Moleculite representative will follow up with you after the program. And if you have additional questions about today's program, you may contact Moleculate directly by submitting an email using the Contact Us application found in the bottom tray of your console. You may also indicate your interest in learning more about Moleculate by participating in our brief exit survey. As a reminder, we have included a link to additional topic resources available under the resource document icon, so please be sure to review these resources at your convenience. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available in full on demand, so please look for our follow-up email that will alert you to the on-demand status so that you can review any material that you missed or simply to go over the webinar again. Also, you will be redirected momentarily to the brief survey that I mentioned. We appreciate your participation in this questionnaire as you leave the webinar. I would like to extend a very warm thank you to Moleculite for sponsoring today's webinar. On behalf of today's guest speakers, as well as the teams at WoundSource and Moleculite, thank you for joining us and for taking the time to view this program. My name is Miranda Henry from WoundSource. Take good care and have a great day. <laughs>